Hello. Hi, sorry, Kate. No worries. <laughs> We're just live. We're just waiting for Rosanna to join, then we'll kick off. Okay. Phew. Thank you. Just on another webinar, which started like three minutes late. And uh, uh, yeah, anyway, it's my fifth webinar. Oh, no worries. <laughs> no worries at all. Thank you. I think we'll kick off. Um, Rosanna will be joining us shortly, so um, I'll just do a quick introduction. And thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon for our live webinar on mental health and COVID-19. My name is I'm Head of Research, Policy and External Relations at Community Trade Union. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by some brilliant guest speakers this afternoon and to share their thoughts with you on how we can help each other improve our mental well-being during this difficult time and to answer any questions you may have. Today we'll be joined by community members and hello to you all um, and we're also going to be joined by viewers who might not be a member of a trade union or a member of community. So I'm going to take this opportunity to welcome you um, and if you want to find out a bit more about community to have a look at who we are, what we do um, and why you should join our movement I encourage you to look on our website at 10 reasons to join community and get in touch if you have any questions or any thoughts after the event. So this week is Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, and probably the most important week that we've focused on so far. Not only is the nation's physical health at risk, but our nation's mental health is also under immense pressure. Many of us will be feeling worried, anxious or isolated and will have experienced problems um, with our own mental health during this really challenging and difficult time for all of us. So before I introduce our speakers and kick off the event, I want to thank everyone who has already submitted and sent your questions in. Um, and to remind everyone that's watching that you can submit questions on the comment box on YouTube, uh, where we'll be keeping an eye and feeding those into our speakers. If you're on Twitter, please tag us using at Community Union, um, and we'll make sure to um, retweet you and, and follow you as well. So our speakers this evening are Rosanna Allen Khan, who is a Member of Parliament for Tooting and Shadow Minister for Mental Health, um, and Simon Blake, CEO of Mental Health First Aid England. I'm delighted you both able to join us and speak with us today. And thank you again for taking your time. Um, I'm sure it's a really busy week um, for you. So we really appreciate it and thank you. So first I'll hand over to Simon and share a few of your thoughts and, and then Rosanna, and then we should have about 15, 20 minutes to take more questions and to answer ones already submitted. So over to you, Simon, and thank you. Great, thanks very much. And thanks for um, inviting me. I guess um, it's really easy, isn't it, to, um, uh, to think about all of the, the bad things. And I guess we will talk about all of the challenges, but I just want to start by saying, who thought that we would be able to adapt so quickly and so well um, to so many things with all of the struggles, with all of the challenges. And of course, for some people, um, there are really, really difficult times that are happening as a result of lockdown, but also in the times ahead. But I do just want to celebrate, and I guess that take courage from uh, you know, how many um, things we have, have managed to do so differently, including you know, uh, events like um, tonight. I've done five webinars today as part of Mental Health Awareness Week, and they would all have been different events. So we are adapting into all sorts of, of, of really, um, you know, in all sorts of creative, creative ways. I guess um, that said, um, we also know that uh, you know, lots of people are feeling incredibly anxious, that there is heightened levels of emotion, um, heightened levels of anxiety, whether 
that's you know to do with our own um, uh, financial security, job security, whether that's to do with um, health and well-being, whether it's to do with partners, whether it's to do with parents, shielding. You know, we've all got all sorts of things, and never has all of us um, and all of our you know, emotion um, been, I think, so uh, so on view. Um, you know, whether we're working at home and people getting a lens into our lives or trying to you know continue going into um, into a workplace. So I think you know, I was asked to talk a bit about tips for those working from home, tips for those still um, going in um, to work and, and to do so in a fairly short amount of time. So just very quickly, I guess, some tips from about working from home. There are sort of five or six things which are really, really clear. The first is that we need to um, try and establish, uh, establish uh, no, the first is that we need to accept that we are in extraordinary times and that there is no normal and uh, yeah, whether whatever it is that we've got to do that we just accept that, you know, children on laps, you know, uh, uh, partners coming in, um, you know, across whatever it is, that there are all sorts of things which just are the new um, usual. But um, in addition to that, we need to think about how do we um, create routines um, for ourselves so that we um, we, we start off the day with a clear sense that we are going um, to work. How do we um, end the day really clear that we've turned um, our computers off and, and put them away, you know, not leaving them in the same space that we're eating or the same space that we're watching telly, so that we try to give our, our brain the best chance of, of having some separation between um, home um, and work. And also to um, remember that uh, you know, staying active, um, that when we are... Um, in usual workplaces that often we will be just moving around and that gives us both physical exercise and we know that's good for your brain but also time to uh, to process information time to to think about things to join the dots without being you know, on another um, zoom call and without being you know going into to something um, else so really trying to find ways to keep active and to move around when we started, there was very much an emphasis on staying connected, um, and that is obviously important. And you know, talked a lot about using video camera instead of telephone, and making sure that we were checking in with people. I think my my the flip side of that now is let's make sure we also find time to disconnect. That actually it's tiring looking at ourselves on video and um, calls all the time. And how do we? Um, yeah, let's use the telephone. Yeah, so that we can walk at the same time as doing um, calls or whatever it is. Um, let's um, make sure that we um, uh, think about our well-being when we are planning to work all day and then join for you know, drinks in the evening uh, over the internet as well. But that disconnection piece is, is incredibly um, important. Um, and then also thinking about uh, what, what support do we need and what support can we give um, both in the workplace but also um, in our personal life. I think you know, we've seen um, enormous uh, uh, coming together of communities and groups and people um, uh, helping. And, and so how do we make sure that we are clear when we need help? How do we make sure that we are trying to understand and think about when people do need help? And that really is about understanding each other's circumstances. Um, and then just in terms of thinking about uh, those people who are going into work, and I know that um, there's a lot of anxiety from different people uh, about using public transport, about being in the workplace, and, and you know, what does it mean after being in quarantine about going back into the workplace? And I guess you know, the really most important thing about that is to be conscious about the things which are worrying, feel conscious about the things that you can do something um, about, and, and you know, whether that's wearing a mask, whether that's walking, whether that's cycling, um, and then to be sure that uh, your employer is also talking uh, uh, to you about the steps that they are taking to ensure that you are kept safe. Um, and, um, and if you're not comfortable with that, talk to your trade union and talk to uh, others and really you know, just seek out the assurance um, that you need, seek out the ways that you can um, feel comfortable and, and, and safe and, and where you, um, and, and just keep, keep on that, keep that conversation going. This isn't, you know, we're not going to suddenly return to to the past. We're going to go forward into a new normal and we're going to have to learn new ways. We're going to have to process the experience that we've had um, and we're going to have to uh, learn to live in that new um, context. And talking about that, ensuring that you're talking with your employer about that is absolutely fundamental. And then the final thing, just to say, of course, 
The best kept secret in most organizations is the employee assistance program. Um, really useful form of support um, if you do want to you know, talk things through, work out some things, whether that's you know, to do with work or personal life. So please you know, do use that or talk to a mental health first aid where you've got them. I think that's my five minutes plus one. Great, thank you, Simon. And in, we'll circulate all the things you've mentioned um, with our attendees and with our members afterwards and on our uh, website, if you could send, send any information over um, that you've just mentioned, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Um, we're now joined by Rosanna as well. Thank you so much um, for taking the time, Rosanna. Um, and I'll hand over to you um, if you would like to kick off with your thoughts. And, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Sorry, I'm a little bit late to joining. These are the wonders of the modern day where we've all had to completely adapt our lifestyle and, you know, uh, communicate in a very different way. And it's a real honour to be here, particularly as it is Mental Health Awareness Week. And I know that so many of you watching this would have been going through such turbulent times in recent months. Many of you will be working on our front line and while we go out and we clap our NHS and care staff every Thursday evening, you guys have also been helping our communities thrive and keep going forward through what has been some very difficult times. For those of you that haven't been working and have been furloughed, you may have extreme anxiety around what your job will look like when you go back. And all of these things are on top of being parents and you know trying to navigate the homeschooling nightmare as I like to call it um, while while being children of elderly parents you may be worried about them I know on a personal level I find it incredibly difficult because I have a mum who is 70 who has just turned 70 she's fit and well no medical problems and we rely on her so heavily to help us with the kids but she has to stay behind closed doors the kids find it very upsetting and my dad he's in a care home and he has dementia and we're not able to go and see him and so these are just normal things like you guys are going through every single day yourselves while either worrying about job insecurity or your own safety when you go to work I know that many of you work in the judicial service and you were worried about PPE and your own safety at work and I know these must be really really trying times and Yes, I have the role as um, the shadow cabinet member for mental health, but as far as I'm concerned, that is just a title. I am a, a woman, a normal person, just like you guys, who happens to be a politician, but who's also been a medic for 15 years and is deeply, deeply committed to mental health and it having parity of esteem with physical health, not just in words, but in actions. And in my role, I really, really want to take that forward. And I want to do that in a number of ways. First of all, by being really accessible, like I hope tonight um, you know, we, we are doing in, in showing you how much we care about your mental health, your physical health and your general well-being, And also about saying, what can we do to support you guys through this COVID period, after the COVID period, but also going for forward what do you need? And I think we all need to look at things like breaking the stigma around mental ill health. And I'm sorry if Simon said this before while I was trying to navigate my technical difficulties, but if you have, I'm going to repeat myself, Simon. Yeah. But, you know, challenging the stigma of mental ill health. Never again should people feel like they have to call up their work and pretend they've got the flu because they don't feel well. They don't feel well enough to get out of bed. They don't know how to navigate that. We need to make sure that we support our reps in the workplace with their own mental health, like I know Community Union is doing already, but it's about supporting those in the workplace who are supporting others. We have to have to end the stigma. We also need to, to look at how we challenge, and this is where my role as a politician can come in, how we challenge some of the things that make it difficult to access the help, even when you do come out and speak openly about suffering with mental ill health. Why should people have to wait so long for an appointment to talk about things that are so necessary. And I think it's really important during this time, if I think about some of the things that are really, really vital, it's acknowledging that it's okay not to feel okay. It really is all right to say that you are struggling. And I guarantee you that probably half of your friends at least are feeling the very same. We know that the NHS and care sector have, um, have got a, a helpline that, that that has been set up that they can call, but most people don't even know about it. And for some reason, most people don't even feel that they can call it or want to call it because we know at least 50% of <laughs> NHS and care staff are suffering with mental ill health at this point, but only 0.1% of them have picked up the phone and called this hotline. 
So we need to look at what we can do to make people feel safer around talking about having mental ill health, about saying it's okay not to feel okay, and you don't need to feel guilty. I hear all the time people saying, oh, Rosanna, I feel really bad because, you know, I have got a roof over my head and I have got enough money to feed the kids. And I know there are people out there that, are, that you know, have it much worse than me, but I, I feel really down. I, I struggle to get out of bed. I don't get enjoyment out of doing the things I used to do. I feel real anxiety. And that's okay. It's all right to own every single feeling that you have and to ask for help. Look, there, there are so many ways in which our lives are different at the moment. And so many of us are grieving. Many of you will have lost loved ones, you know, co-workers, people in your families. You would have been unable to say goodbye. You would have been unable to grieve. You've been unable to go to their funerals. And these sorts of things can also have a devastating impact. Also just uncertainty. It felt like almost overnight we've gone from living our normal lives to next thing you know, we're wondering if the supermarket is running out of toilet roll and our kids are like running around the house expecting to learn something from us, all while worried about our own jobs and our own families. So this is, these are very, very trying times. And sometimes people say, right, Rosanna, what are your top tips for getting through this time? And I would say that A, and I'll repeat it again, it's okay not to be okay and share that. Pick up the phone, talk to a friend, because so many people are feeling absolutely the same way as you may be feeling. And sometimes, you know, I know everyone's Zooming now and Skyping and things like that. Sometimes you may not feel like having a video call. Maybe you don't feel like getting dressed and, you know, like brushing your hair and, and you know, and, and actually someone seeing your face. Say that to your friends. Can we just have a normal telephone call? That human interaction is so important, particularly for people that are living on their own or are just a bit fed up of who they're living with at the moment because it's the same people all the time. Have a conversation that's fresh. Have a conversation that's different. Get out and go for a walk if you can. We know we're allowed to do that. You can do that as many times in the day as you like now. And if you can, if you feel that you can find it within you, maybe try and go for a fast-paced walk or a little jog if you can. Um, these are all things that get the blood pumping around the body, get the endorphins going, really boost your your your. Um, energy levels. Watching the news can be really, really stressful. Don't watch the news. If there's something you need to know, you'll find out, that's for sure. If it's making you feel anxious, stop watching it. Don't research COVID-19 new cures, COVID-19 vaccine, COVID-19, can my dog get it? Stop Googling, stop. Stop watching the news, stop Googling, give your mind a rest. If social media is making you feel stressed, just take the apps off your phone for a while and when you feel ready pop them back on i don't have twitter or anything on my mobile phone i've worked out that that's not good for my mental health i have twitter on my on my tablet that i choose to go to probably once a day sometimes more if something interesting's happened in my day and i've tweeted about it and i want to see who cares but other than that i don't have the notifications popping up to make me feel stressed i just don't look at it and in my world often there's a lot of abuse that comes and i just think i don't need to see it it's on a need to know basis and i just don't need to know and most importantly if you need help you can pick up the phone you can call the samaritans you can call the mental health foundation you can call you know so many organizations like simon's the expert on this you know and and reach out to your unions now more than ever you know it's time to be able to say in the workplace that i need help and that is okay and just one last quick thing I just want to say thank you to everything that you're doing because it's you guys that are keeping us going at the moment we can't do it without you 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 are brilliant and you deserve just as much applause and recognition as people who are working on the NHS frontline at the moment so thank you for doing this this evening and I'm just so delighted to be here finally <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosanna. I really appreciate that. And thanks to both of you again for those really insightful opening remarks. And you've actually answered a lot of questions that were sent in before, particularly around tips on looking after your mental health during this difficult time um, and advice as well. So what I'll do is I'll take a few questions that we've had submitted beforehand. Um, and we've had one that's cropped up on our YouTube comment that I'll take as well. Um, and I'll probably put it into three questions so and take it between you if that's OK, so we can get as many questions in as possible. Um, the first question was from Alan around trade unions and how COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of trade unions and what Labour might do to increase trade union membership among workers, which might be one more directed for Rosanna. Uh, um, and employers, we've had a question from Sophie on how can employers promote good mental health while people are working remotely. Um, and one from YouTube with a mix of understanding with a lockdown restrictions 
in England, there's an aspect of guilt when taking part in outdoor activities. Do you have any advice to manage this feeling? Um, Simon, do you want me to hand over to you so you can take the one on perhaps employers and the most recent YouTube question? Yeah, sure. I mean, in terms of employers' mental health, what I'll do is say is um, send um, a, a, a document to uh, Kate who can circulate it and make it available, which is about the advice. But um, but interestingly, as I said to you at the beginning, that you know all of our concerns at the beginning around staying connected, you know, it's really about making sure that we stay um, disconnected as much as we stay connected um, now. Um, things like reducing you know, Zoom calls, you could literally be on them. You know, if you do hour meetings, you don't have time to go to the toilet. So I've adopted a counselling hour. So 50 minutes if it used to be an hour meeting, 25 minutes if it used to be a half an hour meeting. So you've always got um, a few minutes. Um, every day, um, book in an hour, which is literally time to just think rather than to do. I think that obsession with doing has become um, even stronger in this environment. Somehow, yeah, we've become busier. So trying to make sure um, that we do that. And from an employer perspective, I think you know, the really important thing is about recognising we've got to have good job design. There's no point having wellbeing initiatives if we don't have jobs which people can do with the training and support to be able to do those jobs. Um, line managers need to feel um, uh, confident and, and to engage with and understand around wellbeing and mental health. And um, you know, mental health first aid is obviously a, a, sort of a part of that infrastructure and it needs to be recognized that well-being and performance are part of the same thing it's not do we drive high performance or do we focus on well-being it's we focus on both in order to um to, to really enable people to succeed i guess on the mixed messages piece i would just say um for me it's working out um about the risks you know the restrictions are there why is social distancing in place it's in place in order to protect us from uh, uh, the the virus and so the guilt I don't think well I grew up in a very strong Methodist family I've learned that guilt is never a good thing um, and that we but really it's about understanding what is it that the rules and the restrictions are trying to protect us from and then trying to do our best to um, to, to live by that so we've made a decision for example we're not going back to the office until September um, and some people are saying but we we should like, but then we, we, as people who could work from home, take up space on public transport for people who can't uh, work from home. So it's not just thinking about us, it's thinking about our impact on other people whilst trying to um, you know, ensure that we, we reduce transmission of the virus. And Rosina obviously knows the medical uh, bit much more than I do in relation to that. But it's, that to me, is, as long as I know that I'm doing everything I possibly can to prevent transmission, then that feels to me that we don't, there's no need for guilt in that equation. Perfect, thank you. Rosanna, would you like to pick up any of those questions um, and points and perhaps pick up the one on trade unions and, and labour and yeah. trade union membership? That would be great. Yeah, yeah, sure, thanks. I'll just quickly start on the guilt point because that, that's one that I've heard a lot of people say. I think though, the like if we frame everything that we do around what am I doing to protect others, that's a really good one. And, you know, exactly as Simon has said, um, when we think in those terms, then, then whatever we do is mindful. And when you're going out for a walk, when you're going out for a jog and you are keeping the two meter distance, you're improving how you feel as a person, which helps your relationships with those that you love and you're staying safe at the same time. And when it comes to things like like working at home, it's like taking decisions that, yeah, okay, if you can work from home, do, because it doesn't take up space in public transport. But if you have got someone who is working from home, who you know is struggling with being alone and feeling anxious because they're not having that human um, interaction on, on a physical level, then maybe sometimes you could think, well, is there something we could do where, where we could meet in a way that is socially distancing that might support that person who is feeling lonely and anxious? Um, but everything that we do, as long as we ask ourselves, what is this doing to keep others safe? Then I think it's fine because we have to be able to support our own mental health. And you're not good to your colleagues in the workplace if you haven't addressed, if you're feeling mentally unwell um, because you haven't gone out and, uh, you know, and done and done the things that keep you happy. So I think it's really important. And, and, and just try not to feel guilty because that is a very dangerous place to get a very dangerous, dark place to get into. Um, and on and on the trade union membership oh gosh i am 
the biggest advocate of joining a trade union and I'm not just saying that because I'm a Labour politician because I know what it's like to grow up with a single mum who didn't know about trade unions and how much we really struggled as a family when she needed support at work or representation at work or she was unfairly about to lose her job and we struggled and didn't have help and support and I think I think a trade union is invaluable and I always always encourage people to join trade unions particularly if they work in you know like for very small companies they need to be protected as well it's not just about large companies but it's important because obviously all the good things that we know about trade unions are, you know up until now but I think so many trade unions are taking the COVID crisis really seriously and supporting uh, members well-being and mental health throughout this crisis extremely well they're taking it very seriously so I think that there are so many benefits and for the for the minimal costs really relatively like the relative minimal cost of joining I think the benefits far outweigh not being a member at all and there are so many resources and it's a great way to meet other people and get involved and get to know more people and at this time where we're really forced to look into ourselves and often feeling quite lonely joining a union and being part of that and meeting your reps and your local members can be a really really lovely way when all this is said and done to sort of make some new friends as well. Great thank you um, and we'll just take a couple more questions um, as we've got about five minutes left if that's okay with both of you and your timings and probably We've got a lot scheduled in for this evening. Of course. So we've had three more questions coming in, um, pre-submitted. One on support for pupils and schools, which I think is a really interesting question from Cameron, on the black hole of support in primary and secondary schools and pupils suffering from mental health difficulties. Um, and the difficulties faced by those students being exacerbated by the current crisis and the need and requirement for the system to be updated and what you think can be done to help facilitate that and help um, students and pupils who are struggling with their mental health. We've had another question on from Tom about the Equality Act um, and for those who might feel discriminated that they don't meet the criteria in the Equality Act if they do experience mental health problems um, and what needs to be done to sort of reform that Equality Act, if anything, and how we can get better support for those people. And we've had another question from Phoebe, which I think it might be good for us to touch on a bit more, particularly around people who are shielding um, and how they can sort of help protect their mental health in particular and if there's any sort of key things that, um, people who are shielding can consider and think about going forward. Um, would either of you like to, to take off first? Simon, would you want to go first again? Is that all right? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, support for pupils in schools, um, you know, clearly much more needs to be done um, for, and if you think about their emotional well-being, if you think about reintegration into schools, if you think about, you know, five-year-olds suddenly not having the soft play areas you know there's there's going to be all sorts of things which um we need to think about from that lens and then there'll be people with um uh mental health conditions and mental health problems who weren't always getting the support um before and haven't for many 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 years um and so there is yeah a real need for um improved support both in um the understanding of 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 the all of the um, people within a, a school's uh, system, but also then that specialist support and referral into um, specialist services um, as well. Young Minds um, UK has just put out a, uh, a along with uh, I think about 30 other organisations, a sort of a manifesto for want of a, a better word around what needs to um, happen. Um, and, uh, and they, I would see as experts along with Place to Be and others in that. So I would encourage you to have a look on, on the website because I think yeah, this is going to be really important to be led by the experts and then to keep on making um, sure that we're all um, uh, supporting that. Um, in terms of the Equalities Act, I'm not going to um, uh, say very much because I don't know enough about um, uh, exactly um, uh, what it is you are um, thinking um, is and isn't protected, and I guess as you know, thinking about your your um, protecting your work, your mental health in the workplace, there are still duty of care responsibilities regardless of of the Equalities Act. But in terms of shielding, um, I mean, I have elderly, and um, my mum and dad would hate me to call them elderly. My parents are over seventy five, um, and um, they've been shielding for. Uh, since uh, the beginning. It took me a long time to persuade mum that she was one of the old people that was being talked about. Um, but finally persuaded, actually, the key thing that we have worked out for them is that every day we have to 
um, encourage them to think about something they're looking forward to. Um, so whether it's something that they're going to eat, whether it's something they're going to watch, whether um, we, um, uh, one of the grandchildren is going to phone them. Um, I do a daily um, call, but then they're making sure that things go into the post. And with it. So I think there's just, you know, how do we create those moments of joy and help them to create moments of joy? Um, and also, you know, I, you know, the conversations which are, you know, how, what are you, what are we actually grateful for in this moment? You know, and gratitude, which we know works for, you know, in all circumstances, but, you know, in some of the, the worst times, actually really good to actually, you know, are there one, two or three things that we're really grateful for, which is something which I do every day before I get out of bed. And this morning was peanut butter was one of my three. Um, no idea why. But yeah, for, for people who shielding, how do you create that sense that actually, yes, it's tough, but there m- could be much more difficult things which you need to do and, and trying to keep you know, that sense of confidence and optimism. Great, thanks, Simon. And um, Rosella, mm-hmm. Great. Um, so the schools issue, hugely important. And I'm working um, with, with my team um, in education to, to look at how we can work cross departmentally because it's absolutely essential and it is a quagmire because you know children are anything from babies to 18 um, with with unique needs and difficulties at every age and I think it is so important that we focus on on their mental health not just for those that everyone talks about who they're worried about in terms of children from like, domestic violence households or those who who are so heavily reliant on free school meals but just generally, because so many children are really suffering with, with not having the opportunity to say goodbye to their friends at primary school before they go to a new school. They're finding themselves tearful and they're not quite sure why. And they're going through all the same life stresses that it means to be a teenager or to be working your way out in this world when you're five or six. Everything is so strange. And I think it, it is so important that we work um, across departments to really put our young people at the front and center of this and making sure that CAM services, child and adolescent mental health services have the support that they need because they've been drastically underfunded and under-resourced until now. And part of my job is to make sure that that doesn't happen going forward by pushing and pushing and pushing because because we, we will have a crisis in young people's mental health far beyond what we've seen already if we don't get on top of this at the earliest possible opportunity. Look, the Equalities Act, I think, I think it's all about saying that if you feel as though you're struggling with your mental health, that should be all that you need. You don't, you shouldn't have to have a set of criteria that decides whether you're, whether you're psychologically feeling unwell enough to warrant help or support. If you are not feeling okay and you go to your GP and your GP says, yes, you have, you have got symptoms of depression or anxiety, whether or not you need medication for it, it should be acknowledged and supported in the workplace and, and, being taken as legitimate. You don't have to have, I, I personally don't believe you, you must have a you know, diagnosis of bipolar or like schizophrenia or you know, like manic depression in order to have your challenges with mental health recognised. That's really how I feel about it. And just in terms of shielding, gosh, I keep a gratitude diary as well, Simon. I'm not fantastic at filling it in every day. I really do try. And I do mine at the end of the day. And I, and I think about what I've been grateful for that day. And I find it really is a lovely way to sort of move forward in this. And I think when, when we talk about shielding, um, I think it's really important to remember there's so many young people shielding as well mm. who, have, who have had cancer at some point in their life or who are, who, who are receiving chemotherapy or who have an autoimmune disease that stays at bay most of the time and nobody would ever know that they have anything to you know, like worry about. Maybe on some form somewhere in Oki Health filed somewhere in the back room, they would know. But now they have to come out and tell the workplace, yeah, actually, I, I, I can't come to work because I'm 34 and I've got an autoimmune disease and I'm meant to be shielding. These things we have to think about really, really play an impact on people's lives. Um, And I think that we have to be really careful um, in terms of the narrative about people that are shielding and people that are over 70s, that they're not just a group that are just written off about and oh, they they can come out when we got a vaccine. When we got a vaccine, those guys can come out. Who's to say that? Why, why shouldn't we be saying, look, there could be a point of an hour a day where only those that are shielding should be able to go for a walk. We have to make everybody feel as though they are equally important and we have an opportunity to do that right now. And people who are shielding should not be put to the back burner to be worried about once we have a vaccine in God knows when. How do you clap on this? <laughs> <laughs> 
Very well said. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Completely agree. Um, and really, really helpful comments um, and, and advice for, for our members and everyone who's watching. Um, so I'll ask you to do um, a few closing remarks and, and on that, perhaps take one, one final question as part of that remark, um, if that's OK with you. Um, another question from Alan, who, who has asked, how can we have optimism for a better future in such a difficult and um, time, um, which I think is, is, might be a good note for us to end on. Um, Rosanna, would you, would you like to? Um, sure. Max, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. I think you might be going down in my gratitude diary tonight for, the, for, for a nice question that I'm grateful for, because it is so important that out of everything that is dark in, in, in the world, we take out the light. Um, and one little atom of light um, is enough to light a darker room. So that just shows you how, like the power of thinking positively. And Alan, it's right now, the things that we can hold on to, to be optimistic is that as a country, we really have listened to the advice. I would say the vast majority of people have done very difficult things and they've stayed in, they have socially distanced, they have isolated themselves in order to protect others. That says something about how we view each other and how we support one, like support one another and how we really did want to protect our NHS and save other people's lives by doing things that were really quite difficult. And for so many people, they still are. And when we go out and we clap for our frontline staff on a Thursday night, I think it's so important that we remember everybody who's been out on our frontline, driving our buses, working in our prison services, serving at our checkout counters, care and NHS staff. We should be clapping for everybody. And I want to see a world where once all of this is over, we don't lose that sense of supporting and acknowledging and celebrating those that keep us going while we pat ourselves on the back for having got through a very very difficult time so Alan love your question and and also one of the optimistic things to think is look we've been brought together today to do this to talk about something so important in a way that we've not explored doing before which is having to think outside the box and these are some of the things now that I hope we can take forward and really, you know, not lose sight of. So thank you very much for tonight. It's been absolutely brilliant and a, and a real honour to be here. Thank you, Rosanna. It's Mental Health Awareness Week this week, as, as Rosanna said, and 72% um, of people surveyed in a YouGov poll said that they wanted us to come out of this as a kinder society. Um, and you know, if we... Think about kindness not as something that's soft and fluffy, but as a lens through which to think about national policy, about a lens through which to think about how we'd really deal with health, economic and structural inequalities. It could really be a, a, you know, a something which could um, catapult us into a new way of thinking um, about the world if we were all determined enough about it. You know, the idea that we've managed to get people who have been homeless off the streets, um, but may also then say, actually, is over, time to go back out onto the streets again, morally reprehensible. So I hope that we take um, courage, I hope we change the hashtag, having worked for 21 years in sexual health, clap for carers has a whole different meaning, but I hope we do take the spirit of you know, that yeah. supporting frontline um, staff, that we um, recognise that uh, you know, we are adaptable beings, we are creative, we've got courage, and, and if we can, if, if, if that, if there is any upside, those are the sorts of things that has to be uh, you know, a real upside. And I, I know, you know I've never been this long as an adult without going to a restaurant or a pub. I'm realising that my money might mostly be spent better in terms of helping others with the privileges I've got. You know, there are some real, I think there's lots of conversations that people are having in their heads and I hope we don't forget them. I hope we never want to go back, that we only go forward with some of the lessons and experiences from here. But yeah, it feels like we've had a crash course in emotional literacy. We are all talking about emotional well-being, mental health, um, and, and we can't go back. That's my, my mantra in all of this, is we can't go through this just to go back to some of the systems and ways of being before. It, it, wouldn't, it would just be awful. So let's go forward. I'm not going to end on a down. Thank you very much for inviting me to, 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 to be here. It's been great. Thank you, Kate. Thank you and great notes um, to end on from, from both of you. So thank you so much. I think it's given us lots to think about um, this evening and I hope everybody watching has taken at least something um, to either better support you or someone you know who might be struggling with mental health or just finding a bit more about it. 
and, and methods and, and tips of how to, to better manage your wellbeing and mental health during this really difficult time. Um, and just to quickly wrap up and say that the mental health of our members at community, uh, your colleagues, your families has always been a number one priority um, and will continue to campaign on mental health and workplace, not just during Mental Health Awareness Week, but beyond um, and keep talking about it and, and help break down those barriers. Um, there's still a few days left to get involved in Mental Health Awareness Week as Simon and Rosina have pointed out um, and to consider sharing some acts of kindness. So whether it's you know, reaching out to call a friend as we've talked about tonight or a family member who might be struggling um, or supporting a vulnerable neighbour, um, please get involved if you can um, and please continue to speak out about our mental health that our speakers have, have outlined this evening. Um, and thank you all again for joining us. A huge uh, virtual thank you and clap for our guest speakers. Um, and if you've got any more questions, please let us know and comment in the box. And thanks again and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.